I saved over 800 and something families from illegal foreclosures. And how I did that, you know, I would just call the judge's chamber. I would call the judge's chamber. Um, I would call the actual presidents and vice presidents of the bank, letting them know. And I'm not talking about the regional president or the regional vice president. No, I would call the president or vice president of the bank saying, this is illegal. You know, you don't have the promissory note. You know, it's being, it's bundled up, it's being traded on Wall Street. You know this, you know that, blah blah blah, and they would give the home back. So a lot of a lot of that went on. Not to mention, as I kept going on the news, I received a phone call from one of the most powerful men in Maryland, and he told me that I needed to go back on the news to say that there was no foreclosure issues in Maryland, and he gave me the reason why, which blew my mind, which is going to be in my book, which come out in April. Sean Dustin spent time in federal and state prison for drug trafficking and fraud. Upon release in 2006, he had nothing but the clothes on his back, a bag of mail, and legal paperwork. In 2010, he kicked a longtime methamphetamine habit and started the long climb back up the ladder of life. This is the Nowhere to Go But Up podcast. If you want transparency and authenticity, you're in the right place. This is the Nowhere to Go But Up podcast, and this is Sean Dustin. This is Nowhere to Go But Up podcast, and I'm your host, Sean Dustin. Uh, first of all, it is uh, Wednesday, the 27th, and I'd like to uh, let you guys know that I have a very special guest for you this evening. Um, if you haven't read the description, read the description real quick down below um, while I do these announcements. Uh, all of the links and everything else that pertains to this episode will be in the uh, description. Um, all of the links that are relevant, I'll be flat. I'll be flashing them up as well as we go through the, uh, through the, the conversation. Um, but one of the things is if you are uh, watching on YouTube, do me a favor and subscribe uh, down in the corner and thumbs the video up. That would help out a lot. If you're watching on Facebook, please share and like, uh, if you're on the podcast platforms, which this will be releasing to uh, this evening or tomorrow, do me a favor and subscribe. Hit that subscribe button because that helps me become more visible on the podcast platforms as well. A um, couple of things I'm, I'm that I've noticed, and, and one special shout out I want to uh, give to Suzanne Riley, who uh, donated fifty dollars to the show. Thank you, Suzanne. I really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, so let's uh, let's get to the to the episode. We will be talking to Dr. Carmen Johnson. Let me bring her in here. Hello, Dr. Carmen. How are you? Hi. How are you? How are you I'm doing. Do I'm doing good. Today's been kind of a, a hectic day for me, so I'm kind of a little bit scrambled, but we'll we'll, we'll get through it. Yeah, I'm absolutely. I wasn't aware the the little bit I heard of your story just now when I was waiting in the waiting room. I am just so impressed with you. I'm absolutely impressed with you. Yeah. Oh, well, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um. And and how you and I uh, got to uh, meet was uh, on a I do a a Sunday evening. Um, what was it? It was like a uh, it was like a, a reentry type of of uh, criminal justice sort of group that we just come together to talk about best practices or different uh, things that that James Jones, uh, who actually runs that, and Maurice Clifton, people who have been wronged or are wrongfully uh, incarcerated or are going through things in incarceration that are are uh, you know detrimental or just not right. And so I was listening to your story because I, I tuned in that one week and um, it uh, yeah, it definitely ties in with something that I had been covering probably six months ago with the, uh, with the con 
And I, I was able to screen that, uh, that true crime documentary series. And that was all about the 2008 financial crisis, you know, and, and everything that the big short didn't tell you pretty much and the whistleblowers and everything else. And, uh, you know, your story kind of piggybacks off of that because it was the back end of everything that happened because of that, you know, the moratoriums that you, you, you created or were helped people stay in their homes as they were being illegally foreclosed on. And, uh, but I'm going to let you tell that story because uh, that's definitely something that needs to be, needs to be uh, heard. Yeah. So, uh, you know, first of all, like you said, we met through um, Mr. Jones, Mr. Clifton and Miss Riley. And I give my thanks to them for uh, helping me get my story out. And like I just said to you, I'm just amazed at the, the brief clip that I heard of your story. And we really have to talk, you know, when we get time. Very fascinating. I'm very proud of you. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, I am the, the former housing chair for the state conference NAACP of Maryland. And um, some years ago, I was trying to get a moratorium to freeze the illegal foreclosures that was going on in the state of Maryland. Um, and these illegal foreclosures were really hitting the Black communities really, really hard. Now, I'm fully aware that these illegal foreclosures were happening all over the United States, but at that time I lived in Maryland, so my focus was on Maryland. And um, as I was going through the process of trying to get an understanding of what was really going on, when I got all the way down the rabbit hole, I realized what was really happening. And it's funny because the clip that you send me is called the con or something like that. Yeah. I would love to see the full version of that um, subjectively because back then is when I found out about what was really happening. And if people today really knew the truth, I don't think most people could handle it, nor nor can they or will they believe it. Um that's that's the, the 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 other thing to it. Um, but before I was the um, the housing chair for the state conference NAACP of Maryland, I was a I had my own for profit company, which was a million dollar company, which taught financial literacy. So we uh, taught credit restoration, debt arbitration, financial planning, preparation for bankruptcy, rehabilitation after bankruptcy, identity fraud. We would go in and we would do settlements like on people's credit reports. We would contact their creditors. We would pay their debts off right then and there. We were um, a member of Equifax, TransUnion and Experian. So we would report our trade lines, the services that we offered, and also the loans that we uh, paid the debts off with. Now, I didn't hand any money to you in your hand. I just went in and paid all the creditors off on the credit report. And back then, that's when all of those creative loans were going on. Um, they, you know, I guess a lot of the, the subprime lending was happening and, and all of that. Um, subjectively, my business had a relationship with all the five major banks, um, uh, realtors all around the United States, mortgage companies all around the United States, title companies all around the United States. My only competition was Susie Orman, if you know who that is. Um, she was my only competition in, oh, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. in, in the financial literacy game. Um, I also started a nonprofit, which taught financial literacy in the public schools and the private schools. And um, we taught uh, about financial literacy, but we also talked about being self-sufficient. And we also talked about being uh, business owners. Um, which was uh, really, really important to um, my mission and my vision in creating awesome human beings in, in the young community. Um, we also did um, uh, some financial literacy things with some colleges in Maryland as well. Um, so I, was, I had all of that going on on the side. And then, like I said, I became the housing chair for the first, the Prince George's County NAACP. And then the state conference asked me to come on because I was making waves. So they asked me to come on 
to be the housing chair for the state NAACP. And I agreed. And um, I never thought in my wildest dreams that they would abandon me. Like I, I knew that I was isolated and insulated. You know, I knew that the NAACP had a huge following, um, a large membership. And not to mention, they were all around the United States. So I wasn't worried because in my mind, I had this army behind me. Even though some people were trying to tell me the NAACP is not what you think, but I just didn't believe it. And I just didn't see it um, at that particular time. In the meantime, um, you know, I was all over the news, um, you know, asking the, the governor at the time to, you know, please give us a moratorium to freeze these illegal foreclosures that was happening. I was asking the state's attorney at the time, the state's attorney of Maryland at the time to, to please, you know, give us a moratorium. And um, they was really uh, giving, you know, me a hard time. But you know, I'm a fighter. And, you know, in my mind, it wasn't the homes that I was trying to save. In my mind, it was the, the Black family structure that I was trying to save. It was the these were Black husbands and Black wives and Black children. And, you know, uh, you know, I say it on other interviews, you know, the rumor is Black men don't marry Black women. You know, black men only make babies with black women. Well, these were black families. These were husband and wives and children, and they were destroying the black structure. Not to mention it was black families that was living in the woods. And I went in the woods. Well, first I had to get permission from the people in the woods to be able to go into the woods and to hear their stories. And and I went back to politicians telling them, look, it's families that lost their homes to illegal foreclosures and blah, blah, blah. And you know, you got to go see them. We got to help them. We got to do this, you know, and, you know, I was all over the news just telling it all, but I was green. Like I didn't understand how dangerous the industry was. And I didn't understand what was really, really going on at first. I just didn't get it. And, um, I remember one day I I went to my, uh, nonprofit and it was this package at my door and it was a big, huge envelope and it was like a report and it had like almost a thousand pages. And it was a man, I can't remember the man's name, but he was in front of the Senate or Congress, I can't remember. And he was testifying on how the foreclosure industry happened, what happened in the beginning, who all was involved with it and, and what actually happened. And I read page by page by page and it just blew me away. And I Googled this man and I, I found his uh, the recording on C-SPAN um, where he was testifying and, you know, speaking on what happened. And um, and I was trying to tell people about it and they didn't want to believe me, like mainly the NAACP. Like, we need to do more. We need to be, do more. And they wouldn't accept what I was saying. And I was trying to figure out. I wonder what's 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 why are they stalling like this? What's what's really going on? And um, then it got to the point where I started getting strange phone calls, you know, in the middle of the night, uh, people calling my office and just holding the phone and, you know, calling me the N word. And and then I started realizing I was being followed and um, I got ran off the road quite a few times in the middle of the night, you know, leaving from my office. Um, they was coming in and out my homes, not knowing at that particular time, I had the feds following me on one end. And then I had the bank investigators following me on the other, on the other side. And I remember when I would go and give speeches and stuff like that, you know, white men with suits on would come in and take pictures of me. And it was just so odd. And I remember one day um, I was coming to my I was coming in the building of my office and it was a, a white man standing there with some sunshades on. And he, I can't remember what he had on or whatever. And I had to, a meeting that I had to go to. So I went upstairs to get my report or whatever the situation was. And then when I came back downstairs, it was another man standing in the same place with the same outfit on. But he was taller. And I was on my cell phone and I had my briefcase in my hand 
And I stopped and I looked at him and I told the person on the phone, I'm like, is this man standing here? And he was standing here before, but he's not the same man. But he don't think I realized that. And he just kind of looked at me. But it was it was a different guy. So they had been they was surveilling me 24 hours a day. I used to stand at my window and I lived alone at that time. And I would stand at my bedroom window at night and I would watch these men running around in my yard and stuff. And I, I remember telling the NAACP, look, I need bodyguards. I need bodyguards. I, I, I need a driver. I need to be protected, you know. And I couldn't understand why they was not protecting me. Not to mention, I started when it was time for me the, towards the end, when I would go on the news to do interviews, the last few times I had to meet with, like, um, I had to be briefed before I went into the newsroom to be interviewed. And I thought that that was kind of strange. And then I was told, OK, we need you to not make this a black thing that it's not just the black community that's being affected by these illegal foreclosures is, you know, everybody's being affected. And um, I didn't think about it that much back then, which it, it it was a fact, but I didn't think about think about it until just recently in the last couple of years. I thought about Martin Luther King and how he brought in the other races or whatever. But I, I still haven't figured that piece of the puzzle out. I guess maybe the news media wanted me to bring awareness that it wasn't just people of color or was it another tactic? I I, I don't know. But when I think back, I mean, I, I suffer from extreme PTSD and all of that stuff just really scare me. But I just remember those days. Um, I also did a huge march on Annapolis, you know, trying to get this, this moratorium. Um, over 5,000 families showed up you know, um, fighting to get their, keep their homes. Um, not to mention I saved over 800 and something families from illegal foreclosures and how I did that, you know, um, I would just call the judge's chamber. I would call the judge's chamber. Um, I would call the actual presidents and vice presidents of the bank, letting them know. And I'm not talking about the regional president or the regional vice president. No, I would call the president or vice president of the bank saying, um, you, this is illegal. You know, you don't have the promissory note. You know, it's being, it's bundled up, it's being traded on Wall Street. You know this, you know that, blah, blah, blah. And they would give the home back. Um, so a lot of, a lot of that went on. Not to mention, as I kept going on the news, um, I received a phone call from one of the most powerful men in Maryland. And he told me that I needed to go back on the news to say that there was no uh, foreclosure issues in Maryland. And he gave me the reason why, which blew my mind, which is going to be in my book, which come out in April. And because if I say it now, the people going to know who it is. Um, but he told me why, but that wasn't my problem. So he, he, he called me again and then he got somebody under him to call me. And when the person under him called me, he asked me how much did I want? No, excuse me. He asked me, what did I want? And I said, well, I want a moratorium to freeze the foreclosures in the state of Maryland. And um, he was like, well, what else do you want? Well, and I'm so green. I didn't get what he was saying to me. I said, well, I want a commission set up to investigate these illegal foreclosures that are going on in the, the Black communities. I want to know why and how this has happened. And I want to sit on that commission. And he said, well, what else do you want? And I said, "That that's it. That's what I want. Not knowing when I look back now, they was asking me about a bag. Like, how much money did you want? That's what they were asking me. They was asking me to sell my people out. And I couldn't do that. You know what I'm saying? E you know, e even if I understood at that time what they were talking about, because I really did. I was green. I, I really didn't know what he was talking about. But even if I understood that, I, I still couldn't. I couldn't do that. I, I, I can't be one of those type of people. I wouldn't be able to sleep at night. 
to today I can I can look in the mirror at myself. You know what I'm saying? And not feel a certain type of way. Um, but moving right along. Um, let me let me let me ask you. Let me, I'm going to interrupt you real quick. Let me ask you a question about how were they illegally foreclosing on people? Like I me, mean, what was the process and, and, and how did it come about? Like what, what was it that, that, what did that look like? Well, I don't want to go all into details, but what I can tell you is that the, 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 the city was part of it. The County was part of it. The state was part of it. The feds were part of it. You know what I'm saying? So it wasn't just, they said that it was the subprime mortgages. It wasn't just that. It was bigger than that. Everybody was making money off those illegal foreclosures. Everybody was making money off the foreclosures that were happening. Not to mention they did they couldn't foreclose legally because they didn't have the promissory notes because the promissory notes were bundled up and being traded on Wall Street. So the only way that you could foreclose, you had to have all the documentation. Well, you didn't have the promissory note because the promissory note was was gone. The promissory note was bundled up, sold on Wall Street, and and the the, the they say the 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 Chinese and the the Arabs bought that all that paper, all that dead paper, because the the market was up, and all of a sudden the market crashed, and then that's when all the it, that's when hell broke loose. Because they had sold all those promissory notes. Hmm. Yeah, that's a uh, oh man. It's when you when you really start digging into this, and if you anybody out there, check out the con. Uh, it's and I'll I'll put up a, a, a the website to it on on the uh, on the screen here at some point. But that really gives you a good picture of of how this whole thing became to be. I mean, it was all about the the Wall Street was trying to get these subprime mortgages, and so they they needed to bundle them all up, like you were saying, and so they were incentivizing everybody below them. So everybody that touched that that mortgage, and and you come in when when you've got that family that can't really afford the house, and they know they can't afford it, and if they didn't outright just fraudulently do the loan they would have you come in and, and make them make them whole on paper again. Right. Whoa. Let's, let's hold, let's back up a second. So, you know, I, I've been a business owner over 20 something years, a successful business owner. And, you know, my thing is, is financial literacy. Mm-hmm. And um, so when I first started my, my company, you had to have a over a 680, 720 credit score and, and higher to be able to get a, a mortgage. So as time went on, the requirements started loosening up and the score started getting lower and lower and lower and lower and lower. So I've always been, I'm from the old school, you know, my, 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 my parents own a, their home, my grandparents on both sides own a home, my great grandparents on both sides own a home. We, I come from a generation of generation of generation of home owners, land owners, business owners, etc. So my thing was, if you can't buy your home with cash, then you 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 don't need to be buying a home. Like I did not believe in 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 getting a mortgage. That's just that's just what it was. I didn't believe in that. Not to mention all my clients I put on household budgets. So I knew how much they was bringing in. I knew how much their monthly bills were, what their expenses were, was how much they had saved in the bank. So as time went on, the requirements started dropping. And they started loosening up their guidelines. And that's when the, those mortgage companies started coming up with all these creative mortgages, not to mention subjectively or consequently. It was a lot of families that was here in the state of Maryland who had credit scores that was 780, 8, 780, 800. They didn't need those creative mortgages. They didn't need subprime mortgages. They was put in subprime mortgages and they didn't need them. Um, I had a a private side to my company and I had a corporate side to my company. So 
you would come into my office and you would get you would get financial literacy services. It would be considered as the private side. But if you came in as a realtor or you came in as a mortgage company or you came in as a bank, you would come in with all your files. I would never see your clients. So you would come in with just your files. So as time went on, I noticed that it was more and more realtors and mortgage companies and and banks. They started coming in by themselves opposed to sending their clients in. Because they didn't want, they didn't need their clients to go through the whole process of a household budget and this and that and all that kind of stuff. All they needed was for me to, 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 to add my services on their credit report, pay off a few things on their credit report. And that was it. Back then, people that had credit scores of 450 was, was able to buy a home if they had two pay stubs. Whereas when I first started my company, it wasn't like that. You had to have tax returns. You had to been on your job for a certain amount of time. You had to have a certain amount of money in the bank. But when all these creative mortgages came out, this subprime lending came out. And then not to mention, remember, the equity was going up real, real fast. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden, it just it just flopped. And so I never was one. I was always preaching to my clients. Why don't you start a business opposed to going to get a mortgage to buy a house? Why don't you buy a business? I mean, why don't you start a business? And I help lots of families start a business. You know what I'm saying? Create businesses in the state of Maryland. So my thing wasn't, I wasn't into them purchasing homes unless they could afford to buy them cash. And like I said, I thought it was odd when the score requirement started dropping. Like, who is going to sell a house to someone with a credit score of 450, 500? And at that time, all you needed was two pesos, a heartbeat, and, 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 and whatever. You know, and um, it, it was disgusting to watch. Because I wasn't an advocate for home ownership. Now, land, that's a whole different thing. Land ownership and, and, and having a business are, are, have always been my two things because that, that is what was instilled in me from my parents, grandparents, great-grandparents moving on back. So I was caught up in the riffraff after I became the housing chair for the state conference NAACP of Maryland. Yeah, that's uh, that man. That's and when you re- when you start digging into this whole thing a little bit more, and you start realizing like how dirty it was, how far it went up, what exactly you know, a lot of these these banks with what they would do, and they they're still doing it now, and they're, we're about to see another, we're about to see another surge here. You know, I know he put the moratorium off to the thirty first of thirty first of March, but I mean, what are you really doing? All you're doing is is just you're prolonging the inevitable and, and, and letting these people dig themselves in a deeper hole that they're not going to be able to get out of. Cause if you're not paying it now and you haven't been paying it up to this point, I mean, let's just say you got a $1,500 mortgage and you're not paying it. And you, it's been what almost going on a year here uh, in March. So it will be a whole year. So you mean to tell me you're going to have to come up with a whole year's worth of payments at 15 times 12? I mean, that's up that's up past 10 like almost 20 grand maybe. So, I consider these as wrongful foreclosures whereas back then it was illegal foreclosures cuz they was just doing all types of fraud back then. So now COVID hit, pandemic, blah blah blah. So now I label these as wrongful foreclosures. And you're right. To just put a Band-Aid on the situation is just effed up. And um, my, I, I, I try not to, because I was so traumatized by being the housing chair and, and, and all of that kind of stuff. I try not to think about it. Like I get emails, I get phone calls, I get messages on, in, in, uh, not on Instagram, but Twitter and, and Facebook. And I just, it traumatizes me. It's like, I don't even want to deal with it. But, you know, I, 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 I try to answer people's questions and, and, and direct them in the right direction. But, I mean, 
to put a Band-Aid on it and people are getting ready to be e evicted from their apartments and their homes are just horrible. It's just absolutely horrible. And uh, my heart's really go out to them. And it's more that we could be doing or it's more that our government need to be doing and they are not. And if people, even Stevie Wonder can see that we, they just giving us peanuts, not to mention, and I'm not a Democrat or Republican, I say that all the time, but Trump got on TV and he said, this, this is the reason why I didn't sign this stimulus package. This is all the junk that's in here. And he read it. And people still wanted him out. People still wanted to boot him out. Not saying I wanted him to stay, but I'm just saying. And then here it is. We we now now look look at where we at. We we in the, we. Yeah, I mean it, it. It's we're 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 heading down. We're heading down a a, a colli to a collision course, and people don't really understand it because they get they get fooled by the theater that they see in front of you, which is a national scene. Which I mean, honestly. And I get caught up in it too, man. I I I got to be honest because it's hard not to, you know. When you when you're watching the news, I don't know if anybody else feels the same way about this, but when you're watching the news, I I feel like if if you're paying attention to the to the politics, American politics, like you're in an abusive relationship, you know. And every time you turn on the news and you start getting and they start bombarding you with everything, it's like, damn, man, you're you're getting traumatized each time you turn that box on. Because it's the same thing, just repetitive, 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 and 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 it's being framed in a certain way, and 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 all of the media seems to be in on it, and they're framing things in a way where you just you if you know what's going on and you can't stand it, you tune out. And if you're tuning out, then that's, that's another place that they want you to be. Cause if you ain't paying attention, then you're not paying attention and you don't know. And you know, then there's the other group that's paying attention so closely to it and not paying attention to the other side of it, which is alternative media, other sources of information. So you can kind of maybe piece together some truth, you know, by hearing the other side, but a lot of those people aren't listening to the other side. They're just listening to what's being fed to them. And it's, I was listening to, to Jordan Peterson and another an individual uh, having a debate and it was really interesting, you know, cause they talk a lot about history and, and, you know, fascism and, and what different, different uh, societies when fascism started and all of that stuff, man. And it was really interesting to see uh, the, the, I guess you would call it the uh, similarities of what happened in the past and the past always repeats itself. And there's, there's a reason. And I started thinking about this myself too. Like when I was in my six, you know, my, my early twenties to my thirties, you know, I wasn't paying attention to anything. And, but I, but you know, the, the significant things like the savings and loan thing happened. That was the, you know, the first act of what we were, we're witnessing right now. Then you had 2008 and that's, that was the second act of this. Now you've got this one here, which is the third act, but everything has a pattern. And if you've been around long enough, by the time you're in your thirties, maybe your late thirties into your forties, you start realizing what, well, wait a minute, that happened that like that's not it, it, it you just and, and then you you can't you can't wrap your your mind around it because you don't want to think or believe that somebody's capable of doing that but they are i mean just think about it you kick somebody out of their house uh you eagerly illegally foreclose on them the bank takes that property back and then they turn around and flip it again they did that to they did that to five million families in the first one in two thousand eight. Five million families lost their homes. And if you don't know somebody that did, you know somebody who was affected. That's how big this thing was. So how did how did you end up getting getting caught up in 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 the conspiracy? Because that's really what it was, right? It was a conspiracy. You know, it 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 was the 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 strangest thing. Um, I remember when um, I was first raided and I was thinking this has to be a mistake. Like, I mean, I knew all these politicians, I, you know, I, you know, had them on speed dial, you know, I, you know, went, did, went to Christmas parties with judges and the prosecutors and all kinds of stuff like that. And, 
And I just knew when it first happened, it was some type of mistake. You know, I paid taxes, you know, I, you know, kept my, my, my money in the bank, you know, for years and years and years in the same account. And, you know, I did everything the right way, every single thing the right way. And um, so when they raided me, I just knew mm, this, this, this is a mistake. It's going to work itself out, you know, but, you know, and I went and then and, and hired, you know, one of the, the top attorneys in Maryland and, and we went and sat down with the assistant state's attorney and he was like, everything looks good. You know, but we're going to go through your books one more time. You know, these are some of the best books that we've seen in a long time. And, you know, and I'm a Virgo, so I got everything organized. Everything is really, really organized. And my CPA had been with me for years. My corporate attorneys had been with me for years. My little Methodist bookkeeper had been with me for years. My computer guy, everybody was was a close knit family. And um, so then I, I noticed, you know, months was going by and, and they had took a large sum of money from me. And so months had, was going by and then a year went by. And I'm like, look, you need to ask them to give me my money back. And um, so when I started asking them for my money back, is around the same time that I was on my high uh, demand in a moratorium for the people. And um, next thing I know, I was indicted. So when they raided me, they didn't indict me. They just took my money. They didn't, they, I didn't go to jail or anything like that and trying to figure out, well, hmm, that's odd. Well, you know, what's, what's, what's going on with that? And um, so when they indicted me, my attorney was like, do you know anything about these properties? And I'm like, no, I don't know anything about that. I don't know what this is. So anyway, moving right along, they charged me 24 counts of mortgage bank and conspiracy to commit wire fraud. They slid me in a case with 14 Tanzanians. And um, the two, two head Tanzanians were realtors. So I knew who they were. And by this time, this was 2014. So 2000 seven or 2008, one of them came to my office. And when I put the information through Equifax, um, when I put the person their that client's, that person's client's information in through Equ Equifax or experience system, it came up deceased. So I threw him out my office and I told him to never come back to my office again. And my office door had um, this, it had a, like a two-way door on it. So you couldn't see inside, but I could see outside. So whenever somebody rung our doorbell, we could see who it was. And so if it was him, I would be like, don't let him in. So, you know, I, I blocked his calls, all kinds of stuff like that, because I ran a clean business. So anyway, um, when uh, they tried to get me to take a plea, the feds, the first plea was for 30 years, and I still didn't understand what was going on, nor did I know anything about these properties. The second plea, I don't know what that was. The third plea was 10 and a half years, and I still refused to take a plea. I'm like, why would I take a plea for something I didn't do? I, didn't, I don't know anything about these properties. I don't know nothing about this. And um, they kept telling, pressing the attorneys to get me to take the plea. And I refused. I'm like, let's go to trial. Not knowing that, you know, they had something called a, a blue ribbon jury or they got something, they got like special jury set aside for special cases when they want to bust you in your head. And keep in mind, just to round the numbers off, the feds got a 98% uh, conviction rate. And it's not because they won. It's because most of these people took pleas. Now the other 2%, which is me and, and, and the other the other folks, the two percent, probably like a half a maybe like a half a percent, which are the white guys, a win, get acquitted. And then the other point and a half lose, which was me. Mm -hmm. They bust you in the head. You know what I'm saying? And um at, it's funny because my trial supposed to have went into the following week. That's when my witnesses supposed to have came in. My CPA, my computer guy, my little Methodist bookkeeper, and a whole bunch of other people supposed to have came in to testify for me. They, the feds went to their homes 5 a.m. during that week to tell them they didn't need to come to court. But I didn't know that. You know what I'm saying? So that's that's one thing. And then the other thing is, 
they stopped the trial that Friday. But let me tell you what happened. This was February 18th, February, I can't, February 2015, but I can't remember which day. And it was a lot of snow on the ground. Like the snow was like up to our knees. So I had on my mink coat and I had my jury on or whatever. That Thursday, the bailiff whispered in my ear and he said, don't wear that coat tomorrow and don't wear that jury tomorrow, which was Friday. But I didn't really think nothing of it because my trial supposed to have went into next week where my witness is supposed to come in to, to, to testify. But I didn't wear my main coat and I didn't wear my jury or whatever. They deliberated that that day, the next day. They uh soon as the, the 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 jury, it took them probably like an hour and a half. It was less than two hours to come to 24 counts. Uh, that I was guilty, 24 counts of mortgage bank and wire fraud. Not to mention sitting through that trial, I knew nothing about none of those mortgage documents. Now, what they did show was they showed after credit reports. They didn't show before credit reports. They did do that. They showed after credit reports that only had my company's trade lines on it, but they didn't show the before credit reports where all the junk was deleted off or negotiated off from the creditors. Does that make sense? So it made it look like it was just my my company's trade lines on the credit report. They didn't they wouldn't disclose that okay, this is the before credit report and this is the after credit report. This this woman was banging it out. She she was the boss at credit. They didn't show that. They just showed the empty credit report with just my company's trade lines on it. That was all that they had from me. Now, the two head Africans, they both got on the stand. They both said she's not, and it's in the transcripts if anybody want to investigate it. They both said she's not part of our Tanzanian community. She did not financially benefit, nor did she know about our scam. And then one of them said, but she worked on our client's credit. But I was licensed by the state of Maryland. I was registered with the Better Business Bureau. I was a member of Equifax TransUnion Experian. You know what I'm saying? I was, you know, part of Brad and Dun, Dun and Bradstreet. I mean, I was the nine. I had insurance. I had all of that kind of stuff. So I was a bona fide business. You know what I mean? And then the other one said, well, she knew we were realtors. Well, I was working with realtors all around the United States. You know what I'm saying? And I was working with mortgage companies all around the United States, banks, the, the five major banks, title companies all around the United States. So it 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 wasn't just by those two Africans saying that I didn't know about their scam. I didn't financially benefit, and she's not part of our Tanzanian community. The trial should have stopped. But based on my research now, you know, I don't believe it was a real jury. It it, it couldn't have been. I I, I don't I, I it it couldn't have been. It was it wouldn't have, it would have been no way they could have found me on 24 counts, not to mention soon as they deliberated and they said, and I'm standing there and they went down the line, one, two, three, four, five, all the way to 24, guilty, 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 guilty. And then they got escorted out of the the the, the courtroom. And then the, the marshals, they all jumped over the chairs and I'm trying to figure out what's going on. I didn't even get the benevolence to handle my personal affairs, my business affairs or anything the the prosecutor who is the niece of the most powerful man in Maryland at that particular time told the judge who is a brother who went to Morehouse who grandfather is an activist told the judge she is ISIS she is a terrorist she is dangerous we have to protect our streets of Prince George's County we have to protect our state do you know that judge had me arrested right then and there? And, and this was like his second case. But he knew something was wrong because I'm looking at him and he just kept shuffling his papers. He would not look at me. But to make it even worse, without me knowing, he had court ordered me to solitary confinement for four and a half months. And the four and a half months later was the sentencing. I did not know that I was not going home that day because normally they give you a couple of months. You know what I'm saying? Especially if it's white collar. They, they, you know, I, I heard women 
had up to a year before they turned themselves in. They arrested me right then and there. I'm a practicing Buddhist over 20 something years. I, I, I'm, I, I don't have nothing against, I, I've never been in the Middle East. I, I don't know where, I don't understand it. it. It blew my mind. Not to mention they drove me from Maryland into Washington, D.C., and they put me in D.C. DC jail. And they threw me in solitary confinement. And Sean, it was human fecal matter all over the walls, all over the floors. It was this teeny little metal room. And it was so cold because it was so much snow out there. And it was so cold. It was so cold. And I re- I remembered drop into my knees. And, you know, I grew up in Pentecostal. My mother, uh, God rest her soul, she died December 18th. Um, but I um, I grew up a, a diehard Christian and I fell to my knees with all that stuff on the floors and the walls and stuff. And, and I was just saying, Elo, Elo, Lama Sabathana, Elo, Elo, Lama Sabathana, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, I've done everything you've asked me to do you know, and I just couldn't believe that I was in that situation. I couldn't believe it. I could not believe it. And, you know, I'm the type of, you know, woman, I like nice things and I like things to smell good. I'm sensitive to smells, but I I was in that, that metal room with, I mean, I'm still traumatized by it. So the eighth day that I was there, um, um, the psychiatrist wanted to meet with me and um, he was an African. So I was traumatized by the, just that alone. So he was asking, he would never look at me at first and he was asking me questions. And then he finally put his ink pen down and he looked at me and he said, who are you? And then I was told when I was going into transitioning in, you always give your inmate number or whatever. So I said, well, I'm inmate number, whatever the number was. And he was like, no, who are you out there? And then I said, I'm Dr. Carmen Johnson. I'm the, the housing chair for the state conference and ACP, blah, blah, blah. So he started Googling me. And then he was looking and then he looked at me and he said, look, he said, I'm going to get fired. You're not going to see me again. And then he picked up a piece of paper. He said, I've been court ordered to keep you in solitary confinement in that room for four and a half months until your sentencing. He said, but I'm going to release you into general population so you can fight to get out of here. And I was floored. I could not believe that this brother, this black judge that went to Morehouse did this to me. I couldn't believe that he had did this to me. Not to mention, I was already in that situation. I couldn't believe the NAACP had did this to me. I couldn't believe I could it was like, where are the protesters at? What, you know, what's going on? You know, and my sisters were living in South Carolina. They still live in South Carolina. They had to drive up through the snow to get to me where I finally got to a phone and, and I called them and I'm like, you got to get to my office. You know, my checkbook is laying out. The business checkbook is laying out on the business, you know, desk my in my office. You got to do this. You got to do that. Blah, blah. And I'm the oldest. And I've always been the, the head of my family. And um, at that point in my life, my two sisters had to take control. Like I was just a nervous wreck. Like I couldn't, I was traumatized. I couldn't believe that I was. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, it's gotta be. And I, and I, I definitely understand when I, I, I've been raided before and it is a traumatic experience being locked up, especially if you haven't been locked up before in your, your entire life and you don't even know what that world is like. I can imagine it could be very traumatizing as well. Um, but it, what it sounds like is that you, you weren't willing to play ball with them and then they taxed you for your money at first. And then it's like, okay, well now we're going to, and by, you know, taking you out of, out of out of Maryland and taking you to DC, that's removing you away from anybody that you could help help fight. And then by putting you in solitary confinement, you're not able to do anything because they make it difficult for you to be able to make phone calls to be able to do anything. And so that further removes you from society to where you can't fight. And then it shuts you up to where you have no, no, you can't do anything other than accept what they give you. And it, you know, obviously, obviously, you got close to something, and you 
you know, were being punished. Um, so since you've gotten out, do you, I mean, if they went to those lengths to, to do that to you, to keep you from being able to, to, to tell the truth about what you found in, in that whole situation, I mean, do you, do you have any, any fears now of coming out or? Well, hold that thought right there. I'm going to show you something. <laughs> You don't know I know this, but I have that book. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And I was introduced to this book. Well, I mean, I'm a scholar of metaphysics, science of the mind, and mental science. And um, I found this book buried in the library of the prison camp that I was at, but it was several chapters that was tore out. But I've read the book over and over and over again. So it's funny that you have that up there and you and I had not talked about it. Anybody that, that 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 see that they need to read Power versus Force. It is hot. Um, but anyway, um, well, I'm a practicing Buddhist, and you know my story has to be told in order to help others. Even though I'm not getting the support that I feel that I should be getting from from the community, um, it's I left people behind the wall. You know, even though I was in a camp, it's people that are in prison, it's people that are in jails, it's people that are in cages, it's people that are in camps, male and female and juveniles, that that only a person that have gone through it and know where the land landmines are can assist. Most people that come home they just want to just forget about it. They don't want to talk about it. And, 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 and that's that. I don't want to forget. They, I, they, I am innocent. I maintain that. I, I have begged that the president of the United States, whether it's Trump or Biden, to investigate my case and grant me a pardon while I'm still going through the, the court system, the injustice court system. Now I'm on my way to the Supreme Court. Um, I'm writing this book. And my thing is, I'm not afraid to die for what is right. And what is right is the fact that Lady Justice is not blindfolded. This is an injustice system. What has happened to me, what has happened to so many men and women and, and our youth is so disgusting. That's why when I heard that executive order that President Biden was talking about, um, um, not doing a contract with a, with a, uh, with the private prisons or the DOJ or that's only eight percent. That you you're not talking about those those eight crime bills and seven of them you had something to do with. Now, if he has said that, if he put that in the executive order, now I, now I respect you. But you talking about most people don't understand. They think he said something great and he, this executive order is something great and it's not. My people are suffering. When I say my people, I'm saying the human race is suffering behind behind those walls. And I was in a camp and I was drugged on the floor. I was strangled by guards. I was burnt on my forehead. I was chased through, and, and I'm 54. So I was what, 51, 50 when this happened. I'm being chased around the compound like a baby deer with those racist white guards. I mean, it was horrible. So people are suffering and they are suffering even more since this COVID. They are suffering even more. So for him to, 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 to boast about an executive order that's talking about the Department of Justice is not going to take contracts from private prisons, that don't do nothing. No, yeah. actually... Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I was going to say, yeah, it, it, it doesn't because those... All of the contracts are in the federal system. So Unicor is is almost in every single federal penitentiary, uh, you know, medium, uh, even camps, because I know they got some call centers in some camps as well. Um, he's not talking about doing away with those at all. 
that's that's business as usual. I mean, you know, a lot of times, you know, a lot of these conspiracies, especially the drug ones, when you and I've and I've talked to some people, and I still have ten. I have ten interviews with ten people that are currently serving time in federal prison right now for on a drug conspiracy, which you know they were getting uh, fifteen, twenty five, thirty five years. I mean, for drugs. I mean, I, I've I've seen people, you know, kill people and get less time than that, and. The very reason why they do is because, one, they can't fight for themselves. They're usually poor people, white, black, brown. It doesn't matter. It it has nothing to do with race. It has to do with class because if you're poor, you can't fight for yourself. And guess what? The 98% conviction rate, you ain't fighting the feds, you know, plus all of the, uh, you know, misconduct by the lawyers and prosecutors and everything else to get your ass in there. Once you get there... They've got a they've got an employee for years now, and they can move you from place to place to place, and it doesn't matter where they move you in the federal system. There is a unicorn at some point, and you will even even if you don't want to, you will be forced to because at some point you're going to be like, I need money. You know, your family's going to stop supporting you if you've been there for a long period of time. You will bend to their will. And it's just nothing more than a, than an arm of coercion and an arm of of quieting people that are making making waves. I, I spent time when in Sheridan, Oregon, uh, at FCI Sheridan, and that was a medium. And I was in there with a with a gentleman named Fritz Springmeyer who who wrote the book called Bloodlines of the Illuminati and the Watchtower Society and everything that. You know what I mean? All of that conspiracy theory stuff, you know, I mean, a lot of that stuff is true. I mean, there's truth to it or else people wouldn't be talking about it. Um, but, you know, he got thrown in there as a bank robber and he's a published author. You know, he's published a, a, quite a few books before that even happened. And same thing. He just got too close to something. And, you know, they just like, all right, well, we're going to do something and shut you up. And then anytime that he would talk about his situation, because he would get into the GED because he was a smart guy, right? He was a professor, whatever. And he'd start teaching GED. And the minute he would start talking about his case or anything that had to do with it, they would wrap him up and send him somewhere else. So, I mean, you don't, don't think that these, that these prisons or anything are, I mean, they're, they're used to shut people up too. There are the ones that are doing, doing wrong, but it, it's it's horrible man and like i said you start you start digging far enough into this stuff and and you will not believe what you find you know I, it's it's so weird and i don't mean to offend anyone you know um i did extensive study on you know germany and the, the 30s and the 40s and hitler and the holocaust and and the jewish people and and what was done to them the disgusting things that was done to them and um, I feel like now it's like we're living in a bunch of propaganda. We're living in censorship. We, it, it, it feels, even though, I mean, I wasn't born in the 30s or the 40s, but it, it it's starting to feel like we're going in that direction. And it's, it's so scary. And, you know, and me being a practicing Buddhist, I'm supposed to have no feeling. I'm supposed to be right there in the middle. You know what I'm saying? And but the things that I'm I'm seeing and, and hearing is 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 scary. It's scary. And the government has too much control when here it is, we're paying our tax dollars, and then we're paying for the police paycheck, we're paying for the politicians' paycheck, we're paying for all of their 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 pensions, we're paying the judge's uh paycheck, his pension and her pension. And then they are arresting us or our family or our, 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 you know, our friends or, and it's the, it's the craziest stuff. And, you know, it's one thing, which I'm not a judge of anybody, you know what I mean? But it's one thing to, to go to, to jail, prison camps, cages for something you may have done, but it's a whole different mindset to go when you hadn't done nothing. Like, and I did three years on 24 counts and it was women that was there that had one count that was doing 10 and 12 years, but that three years felt like 30 years to me. 
even though I was fighting while I was there, it felt like three, it felt like 30 years to me. And that's, that's, that's three years I can't get back. So am I afraid for me speaking out? I'm not afraid, um, but I'm a little nervous because I'm female. I'm a woman. Um, you know, I, I do feel unprotected. Um, I need the protection of my, my men. I need the support of my community. And um, but I have to tell my story because my story will ultimately help others. And, and I and I honestly think that a lot of things are, are turning that way. I mean, there's a lot of things that are coming out. You, you can't deny a lot of stuff that you're seeing right now. Uh, you know, and there's there's so much alternative media out there that is, is telling the other sides of these stories, you know, because honestly, I mean, if if I heard I heard a statistic uh, not too long ago and it said nine nine billionaires control. Or it's like maybe nine or, or five. It's like a handful of, of of billionaires control the media. So everything, like not all of it, but like 90, 80, let's just say 85% of the media out there is, is owned by nine people. So everything that's consumed in the mainstream is coming from a group of nine people. And so the only way that we're ever going to combat this type of uh, – uh, I, I don't know the, 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 the way that they're shaping everything. The only way that we can combat that is with our own media, you know, which is like, like what I do or other people out there that are doing the same thing. It's all these voices and all these stories that, that will make their way to people's ears and enough people when they start hearing certain things, you're just, I mean, even if they're not really even listening, we're planting seeds all over the place. Mm-hmm. And all it takes is somebody from their own community or their own peer group to mention something that maybe I had mentioned, you know, or you had mentioned on a show that they had seen prior and they go, Oh, wait a minute. I heard that before. And they hear it enough times. Then they start going, that's when the awakening starts happening because when they start hearing it from their own peer group, and they hear it more than than two or three times, then that sets off a, a bell, and they go, "Oh, okay, yeah, that's right. That's let me look into this." And then they start, you know, figuring out what's going on. But I mean, it's a slow process. You know, they've really got it pretty hemmed up. Uh, you know, with uh, the, the mainstream media. So we got a couple comments here. Um, I'm not sure who the Facebook user is that that sent this comment because I can't. I, it just says user. It doesn't say a name. Um, so the first one is uh, that's why awareness is the key to, to anything that, you know, we're doing and, and you see. Uh, and then it goes, but that's where it starts. It begins with violating the guilty rights. Then they do it to the innocent. And another one, that's correct. We need our own media. So, yeah, I mean, and and, and I do this like anybody that wants to know how to podcast or wants to learn how to podcast or, or has questions about it, I'm always willing to to help people, you know, and point them in the right direction of how to do this. I mean, I'm even, I've, I've tied my own podcast to the nonprofit that I started. Um, and for bringing people, I haven't done everything for it yet, but I mean, at some point it's going to involve teaching people having a studio and having guys that are coming out of incarceration back into the communities and teaching them how to have a podcast, how to, how, how to, how to get your voice back, you know, cause that's really what it's about. It's about, it's about re it re retaking your voice back that's been stolen from you. And so, and, and it's not everybody. Look, some, some people, they go to prison and they, 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 did what they they were supposed to do. They did what they did. They did their time, and then they come back. Um, you know the the sad thing is is that it once you go, that isn't it. What we okay? You you know the crime, the time. It, it isn't over. You know I know that I got uh, statements to you who we are friends. With. Okay, thank you, Kevin Haynes. So Kevin Haynes is the one who sent those. Thank you. I appreciate the comments and appreciate you tuning in to the uh to the broadcast. 
but yeah, it's uh man, there's just, there's so many different facets of, of everything, man. It's just, it's crazy. It's called, it's, they call it the, uh, the octopus. All right. So let's just, just take the world and the elites. There's an octopus and there's eight legs of everything you got the judicial you've got the insurance companies you've got the financial you've got the uh the military industrial complex you've got the big oil you've got pharma you have and it's just wrapped around the world and it ain't it ain't getting any more equal it's 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 getting worse if nothing so i mean that's pretty much all i'm going to say about that um word about an hour right now is there any Thing that you wanted to cover that we hadn't talked about yet. I know you've got a GoFundMe and you've got a uh, a petition that you've almost got a thousand. I know it was you've gotten quite a, f- a few since that last, uh, the since last. The help, since the help of uh, you know Mr. Clifton, Mr. Jones, and Ms. Riley, and and now you, yeah. But I mean, fifty almost fifty thousand views and only eight hundred and something signatures. That 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 doesn't that the math doesn't add up to me. And, you know, usually on my, uh, my backdrop is the universe, but on um, this, uh, this live stream stream yard, it doesn't give my little cute little back uh, drop thing. And I, I just, I have to know that the universe got me. But one of the things that I want to just end with is the mental health standpoint of it and how going to, prison, jails, camps, and cages, it messes your mind up. It messes your mind up. I mean, you know, here it is. I think, I like to think that I'm a sophisticated woman and I I sleep on the edge of the bed because for three years I slept on a teeny little bed and, you know, I, I still eat out a bowl and not a plastic bowl, but a ceramic bowl now, but I can't bring myself to eat out a a, a plate. I, I don't know. And I still eat with a spoon. And um and I'm just being transparent like this this I call it prison trauma stress syndrome, PTSD. It really messed me up. Like if a, if I'm driving and a police drive up behind me, I get the sweating and shaking and I I just I can't handle it. If I see a white man with sunshades on, I think they the feds. If I see a black man with a suit on, I think he the NAACP. Like it really traumatized me. This is what this is what our government did to me. This is what the state of Maryland did to me. This is what the BOP did to me. This is what federal Audison Federal Prison Camp, I was at a camp, did to me. This is what the NAACP did to me. Yeah, I mean, it's I I, I dealt with my own my own uh, uh, PTSD from being in there as well, and and having to. Um, re like when I re-entered society, it was, uh, it, I had to decompress and it was, it wasn't easy. That's for sure. So basically if you guys are paying attention out here, anybody who's watching this going forward, or if you're watching now, do me a favor, uh, go into the description, all of these links from the petition that's, that's scrolling across right now to the GoFundMe to Car- Dr. Carmen's website, uh, you know, the podcast suggestions that she gave, the book suggestions, her Instagram page, uh, and even an affiliate for uh, StreamYard. If you're if you're a podcaster, if you're somebody who creates content out there and you like the way that this is set up, the StreamYard, uh, go ahead and hit that affiliate link. You'll get yourself a $10, uh, $10 credit, and you'll also uh, give me a credit too as well, and that'll help support the show. Uh, like I said, any other way that you can help support the show, you know, the basic way and the, the best way and the cheapest way is to uh, basically subscribe, rate and review and anywhere like on the podcast platforms, you know, rate, review the show, um, subscribe on YouTube, uh, share this story, um, go sign the petition, share this, share this episode out uh, as much as you can. And let's help uh, Dr. Carmen you know, fight this fight because she's not the only one. She just happens to be one of the only ones that isn't, isn't afraid and wants to tell the truth and wants to get the truth out there and help other people. I mean, look, we're, we're, we're getting ready to come into a time where 
this is going to happen all over again. And with the CARES Act and all of these PPP loans and everything else that we're giving out, there's going to be a whole onslaught once once this thing is over of investigations and people are going to start going to prison for fraud on the back end of all of this. You can you can guarantee it. People that have taken out loans, PPP loans, and they didn't use them the right way or didn't read the fine print. If they did something wrong, they will be going after them. So, I mean, we're 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 far from over in this whole this whole mess that we're in. So just keep that in mind and, you know, don't, don't be so, uh, uh, quick to, to judge, you know, there's a lot of things that are happening out there and a lot of things that happen and people go to prison for, you know, not always the reason why, you know, or, or even for a reason other than, you know, somebody trying to get them own selves out of trouble. Uh, we have another, we'll have a couple more of these Cynthia Goldberg, uh, she said, I'm so sorry to happen to you. I too was a victim of a white collar crime. Post incarceration syndrome is real. I experience you all you two are going through. The system is broken. My heart goes out to you. The one part, of, thank you. We, I appreciate that. And I'm sure Dr. Carmen does as well. Uh, but the one correction I have to make on, on the system is broken. The system is not broken. The system is working exactly the way it's supposed to and the way it was designed to. That's the problem. That's the problem with, you know, Biden doing the little bit that he's doing to try and, and, and pacify the criminal justice reform people. Because if he really cared about uh, criminal justice reform, he would be reversing all of the mandatory minimums that he signed in in 94 on that crime bill. The- yeah, they're not- yeah, he would he would be reversing those. He didn't do anything then. He didn't do anything when he was. Well, he did something then that was that created a huge problem, but he didn't do anything any time after that. And in, in the years and even in the eight years that he was uh, vice president, he didn't do anything. So, I mean, you know, I, I know everybody wants to have that. Uh, we call it hopium. You know what I mean? You got that hopium that, that, that you're high on hoping that, you know, somebody's going to do something for you the government's going to change anything he already told you that fundamentally nothing was going to change he said that out in public out in the open and that's exactly what's happening fundamentally nothing is changing i mean we're going back into syria we're going to be going into more wars now you know uh, the other things are going to be happening um the fourteen hundred dollars or actually the two thousand that was promised uh went to fourteen hundred and now it's I'm going to negotiate the 1400. So, I mean, these people don't care about us. All right. They don't, they could care less. You know, you've got other countries right now that are taking care of their citizens and, and giving, you know, a lot of them, they're getting 80% of, of their rate of pay that they, for staying home. What did we get? We got, I think 1200, 600. So 1800 in one year. Hmm. And who's in a third world country? <laughs> so can't get can't get scared now. It's time to start standing up for ourselves. But you know, when I read this one here, the mental health is an issue. Yes, I still cook out the microwave. I, that's why I had chuckled when I read that. I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing with you. This this the post uh, uh, trauma is real. It's okay. real. Yeah. Yeah. Kevin had made the statements. I also signed the petition. Well, thank you, Kevin. Appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Well, like I said, I think I think we've covered pretty much uh enough here and and you know, we can probably come back and cover a whole nother show's worth of stuff as well. Um we definitely need to talk hang out once I I take us out. Um I will talk to you uh in a minute, but I'm going to pull pull us out and in this show And uh, like I said, if you've been tuning in, I really appreciate it. Thank you for the support. Thank you for the comments. Thank you for the interaction. And uh, let's do let's let's do Dr. Carmen a solid and and sign that petition. If you can afford it, go to the GoFundMe and and try to help support in that way. But if nothing else, just share this. Sign sign and share. Sign and share, man. That's exactly what we need. So thank you again for for uh, coming out, Dr. Carmen. I, I really appreciate you uh, being on the show. 
And until next time, guys, I will uh, see you later. You've been listening to the Nowhere to Go But Up podcast. Sean is a single dad, a union blue collar guy, and he spent time in federal and state prison for drug trafficking and fraud. When he was released from prison in 2006, all he had was the clothes on his back, a bag of mail, and some paperwork. Since then, he's turned his life around and shares the struggles and successes on this podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show, and we hope you were moved to connect to the show. Book a guest spot. For merch, Patreon, PayPal, and social media links, go to linktr.ee slash nowhere to go but up. On Instagram at nowhere to go but up now. On Twitter at but up now. On the YouTube channel at nowhere to go but up podcast. See you next time.